What a wonderful promise to know that in days like this and in any ordinary day. You're not alone. There is a God that loves you. There's a God that is for you. He knows everything there is to know about you, and he loves you. It's Palm Sunday today, and we're going to look into the Word of God and consider what I believe to be the heartbeat of Palm Sunday. In just a moment, we're going to look to John chapter 12 and beginning in verse 12. But I first want us to pray together and ask the Holy Spirit to open our understanding and to anoint us together as we look into his book. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for the power of your word, Lord. When things are crazy around us, we can look into the book of life, the word of God, and find peace and comfort and direction. And Lord, today on this Palm Sunday, living in a day that is unprecedented in our, in our lifetime, Father, we're grateful to know that you're in charge, you're in control. And Lord, today I ask you to anoint us together. I pray, Father, open our hearts to your holy word. And Lord, I pray specifically today for those that are wayward in their faith, for those that have fallen back from God, for those that have been distracted, for those that do not know you. I, I pray, God, let an anointing come upon them that would woo and draw them by your Spirit to the knowledge of the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray these things as we surrender ourselves to you and give ourselves to you, and we do that in his mighty holy name. Amen. Well, today, as we consider Palm Sunday and the message of Palm Sunday as we know it, in John chapter 12, verse 12, this is what the Bible said. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. And they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, set on it, as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now, as we look into the message of Palm Sunday of this event, of his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. We could talk about the palm trees. It was a symbol of triumph and victory in Jewish tradition. And certainly when you look at Jesus Christ, he was more than a conqueror. He was victorious. He had all power in his hand. We could talk about the clothes that the people threw on the road as he made his way into Jerusalem. It represented their lives. In other words, who they were, they threw before him because they knew who he was and they recognized who they were. We could talk about ancient Near East custom to cover the path of someone who was worthy of great honor. And here comes the king of glory riding on a donkey. And they covered the path before him, giving him the honor that he was due. We could also talk about the Eastern tradition of a donkey being an animal of peace. Conversely, a horse being an animal of war. And here comes the king of glory riding on a, an, an animal of peace. He is the prince of peace. We could talk about, and certainly it would be relevant today, that when things are, are going crazy around you and things are, are pressing in on you, that he is a source of peace, the prince of peace that can speak peace into your life. We could also talk about that phrase, fear not, behold, your king is coming. We're living in a world where there seems to be amplified fear in the lives of multitudes. One of the messages of Palm Sunday is don't be afraid. The king is in control. But it seems to me when I read this passage of Scripture, there is a crescendo to the story. And that crescendo is when the people begin to cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna. And I want us to zero in on that. It was one week prior to the resurrection. 
Jesus is making his entry into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey and a great crowd of people gathered to him. And this event on the eve of the cross and ultimately the resurrection is filled with powerful revelation, but none greater than that word, Hosanna. It's interesting. John's account here in chapter 12, verse 13, they cried, Hosanna. In Mark's account of this story in Mark eleven ten, 10, they said, Hosanna in the highest. In Matthew's account in Matthew 21, 9, they cried saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It's an interesting word. The word Hosanna is a Hebrew or Aramaic word that is best translated as a prayer. And that prayer is save now or save we beseech thee. It is a plea for salvation. And I have preached for the last 40 plus years on Palm Sunday. And I've preached about all of the things that happened in this story, but I don't believe there is a more pertinent message when you look at this event as what the people cried out to God, save us now. It's interesting, our greatest need, humanity's greatest need has always been long before COVID-19. It's always been the need to be reconciled unto the creator, reconciled unto God and his Christ. And perhaps while a plague of biblical proportions sweeping the globe, If you stop and think that maybe hearts are open and sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit in days like this, entertainment, sports, education, financial pursuits, extravagant pleasures are all gone, and it has become silent in this world. Might we now cry, Hosanna to him? When you step back and view what is happening in the world and and nobody seems to know for how long or what the end will look like, could it be a, a sign that something has shifted in all creation? Could it be that the Spirit of God has come to direct the hearts of men to Him, that His voice might be heard and His name might be declared throughout all the land? God loves the nations of the earth. He loves you. doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what your story might be. He loves you. And I want to encourage you today. If you don't know him, I want to encourage you. Maybe it's been a while that you just open your heart up to him and let him touch you. Let him minister to you. Let him move upon you because he wants to embrace you today. He wants to wash you clean today. He wants to bring you into the family of God today. He wants to speak extraordinary peace into your life today. They cried, Hosanna, save us, Lord. And I tell you, you can almost hear the undercurrent of the cry of humanity today. Save us, O God. Well, saving has to do with salvation. If you look into your Bible in the book of Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, the Bible said, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Grace. The grace of God has appeared to all men. What a magnificent statement that is. It's appeared to all men, bringing salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God so that no man can boast. 
You can't earn salvation. We don't deserve salvation, but it is the gift of God, and it came through the grace of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have said many times, and I say to you today, the greatest love story that you will ever read in your lifetime, you will read in the Bible in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And this is what it said. Hear the word of the Lord. It said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the same came in the beginning. He was manifest to us. The Bible said he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, hallelujah, which were born uh, not of the flesh nor of the blood, but were born of God. And this is what he said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John bare witness of him and cried, saying, this is he of whom I spake. And he that comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but listen to this, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What a wonderful promise. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, the Bible said, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Do you know what that means? That means it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what your story is. It doesn't matter what your past is. Whatever sin was abounding, grace supersedes that. Grace doth much more abound. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, the Bible said, no sin will have dominion over you because you're not under the law but under grace. Hallelujah. I look in the book in Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, and the Bible said of Jesus, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but said he was tempted in all points, just like we are, yet without sin. And then said, let us therefore, because of that, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of God that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help. You find grace to help in the time of trouble. In 1 Peter 5 and 5, the Bible said he gives grace to the humble. And I want you to listen to what he, go back to Titus chapter 2 and listen to what he said. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, not to a select few, not to a handful of people, not to a certain group, but it appeared to all men. Doesn't matter what your personality type is or how much money you've got in the bank. It doesn't matter what your achievements in life have been. It appeared to all men this amazing grace. I look in the book and I read the familiar words of Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 16. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that's who you have to be, just a whosoever, Whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's who you are. You're a whosoever. And all you have to do is believe. All you have to do is open your heart to him. And he will come and he will bring you life. He will bring you joy. He will bring you salvation. I look into Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. The Bible said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just to whosoever. Doesn't matter who you are. Because the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Isaiah 55 and 1 said it like this. Everyone that thirsts, come to the water and drink. It reminds me of what happened in John chapter 4 when Jesus was talking to a woman at Jacob's well, a Samaritan woman. And she began to say to him, how can you give me water when you don't even have a ladle to draw with. And Jesus looked back at her and said, if you knew who I was, you'd ask because whoever will drink of this water, that natural water, will thirst again. 
But whosoever shall drink of the water that I shall give him, the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Hallelujah. There are so many people that have tried so many sources of this world. They've tried every high. They've tried every pleasure. They've tried every relationship. They've done everything they know to do and still yet there is something missing. There's an empty place in their life. But Jesus said, I want to give you something that is perpetual. I want to give you life that will spring up inside of you and you can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't live good enough to get it. It only comes through Jesus Christ. We've got to cry out today, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Lord, save us. They cried out on that Palm Sunday message. Hosanna in the highest The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, and it's grace to live. I tell you, I have for many, many years talked to people that didn't know Christ, and you talk to them about that power of salvation, and they would say, well, not me, because I've been this, or I've got that habit, or or I'm like this. Not me, but what you've got to understand is that the power of God's grace. Now, I know that we're living in days where a lot of people feel like you come to Jesus and nothing changes, that you stay just like you are. But I'm telling you, that is not the gospel message that I find in the Bible. My Bible said, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. There is something about this grace that'll change you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away and behold, all things become new. I tell you a long time ago, in fact, 42 years ago or so, I came to know Jesus Christ. And what I experienced in my life was an extraordinary change that began on the inside. And then it began to work outward and brought change, radical change to my life. And it doesn't matter who you are. I tell you, this mighty God who is sitting on the throne today in the middle of a global pandemic, I'm telling you that God will change your life completely and make you new. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, he that knew no sin, talking about Christ, He that knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Change, transformation. I I read in the Bible, in the Gospel of Mark chapter 5, where there was a maniac, a crazy man. He lived in the graveyard. He would cut himself, the Bible said, with with stones and lances. They would try to bind him with chains and ropes and and he would burst them asunder. He would run naked through the streets and no man, the Bible said, could tame him. But then Jesus came to Gadara where he lived. And the power of Jesus brought such a miraculous change in this man's life as he set him free that the Bible records that the last thing we read about him, he was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Because when Jesus comes, he has the power to transform our lives. I look about this woman that I spoke of a moment ago from John chapter 4, this Samaritan woman who encountered Jesus at Jacob's well. The Bible said in verse 39 of that story, Many Samaritans believed on him for the saying of the woman. She was so profoundly impacted by the words of Christ that everywhere she went, she was changing people with the story of the Lord Jesus. What about the Apostle Paul? I looked in the Bible again and read things like this about him in Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. The Bible said that he made havoc prior to his conversion. He made havoc of the church entering every house and dragging men and women off, committing them to prison. 
I read this about him in Acts 9 and 1. The Bible said that he was yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. But then after he was saved, after he encountered Jesus Christ, the Bible said this about him, and he made this statement in 2 Corinthians 7 and 2. He said, we have wronged no man. I remember one day reading that, and I, I came into a place of conundrum, and, and I began to ask the Lord, how could Paul say that? We saw these things that he did prior, and now he's declaring we have wronged no man, and I begin to understand the impact and the power of salvation and the change that it brings in somebody's life. He makes it as though you never sinned a single day in your life. Hosanna! Save us, Lord. If the change is so magnificent, he wipes the slate clean and you become transformed from the inside out. Hallelujah. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. But then it does something else. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The grace of God resurrects in us a sense of the nearness of the coming of the Lord. I want to just say this to you. There is something significant happening in this planet. As we watch this world grope, trying to find answers for a virus that is sweeping the globe. There's something bigger than this. God is on the throne. There are things that are happening in the unseen world of the Spirit. Could be the judgment of God has come to the globe. It could be that something has been set in motion that will bring about the end of all things. But this is what I, this is what I know. As I consider the coming of the Lord. How close could it be? This world has forgotten him. This world has shaken their fist in the face of God and trampled his truth under their feet. Nations of the world that has forgotten God. Let's talk about our own nation. There's things that God hates that are an abomination to him. The shedding of innocent blood. Nearly 70 million babies have been murdered. We have become so desensitized to that that it's become a part of our culture. I read in my Bible where the Bible said Abel's blood cried out to God from the ground. What about the blood of these babies? How long did we think God would stand idly by? What about idolatry? Idolatry is rampant in America. How long did we think that God would stand by? Sexual immorality and perversion has reached places that no one could ever think it would go. How long did we think that the God of heaven would stand by? Apostate churches fill the land that refuse to declare the eternal truth of God. How long did we think God would stand by? And I don't propose to know everything because his ways and thoughts are higher than ours. But I can tell you something is happening in the plans of God. We're closer to the coming of the Lord than we have ever been. I look into the book and I read and John 14, verse 1, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Acts 1, 11 Jesus ascended, and the angel said to that Galilean group of people, this same Jesus, this same Jesus 
which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into the heaven. I look to the book and I read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, beginning. He's telling us, he told preceding verses, don't grieve like people who have no hope because there's a day coming when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. These are eternal promises of God. The Song of Solomon, chapter 2, he talks about how The time of the singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in the land, and the vine with the tender grape gives a good smell. And said, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. And listen to verse 14. Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. The Bible said in Revelation 22, they shall see his face and his name shall be in their forehead. The grace of God gives us a sense of awareness of the coming of the Lord. And I say this to you, he's coming. The Lord is coming. Get ready. He's coming. And if there's going to be a Hosanna prayer to save us, if there's going to be a salvation, there has to be a Savior. The Bible said in Titus 2.14, He gave Himself for us. You want to know how much He loves you? The Bible said in Acts 4 and 12, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Uh, John chapter 14 and verse 6 said, He's the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by Him. He is the only way to eternal life according to God's holy word. And here's why. Because He gave Himself. If you read the story of the gospel, you'll read the story of Jesus who crossed the Kidron. And he came, was taken out of the garden, and went to hearing after hearing before Pilate, Herod, and then back to Pilate, being charged for a crime that he wasn't guilty of. They cried out, crucify him. They took him and strapped him to the Roman whipping post. And they beat him with a fregellum, which was a torturous weapon. A wooden handle with strips of leather, and on the end of that leather, bone and rock. It would tear into the flesh of the victim. He was performed by a lictor, a trained torturer. The victim had nowhere to go. Blow after blow, they beat him. And he endured that for you. Hosanna, save us, God. They took him dazed and delirious from his beating, marched him up Golgotha's hill, carrying the transverse beam of the cross until finally he fell beneath the load. And they took him to Calvary. They would stretch him out there and nail his body to the tree. The Roman crucifixion, they would drive the spike into the hollow area of the wrist. And the weight of the cross went up and the weight of the body came down. He would tear the flesh up into the palm of his hand. Nailing his feet to the tree. Crown of thorns that was put upon his head. 
a Roman calmus around his shoulders, naked from the waist down. They had mocked him, jeered him. You can only imagine the filth that came out of the mouths of those Roman soldiers. And he endured it all because he loved you that much. There on the cross, he poured out his blood. Uh, Zechariah 13 and 1 prophesied about him. That in that day there would be a fountain open for the house of Israel, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. That fountain was opened at Calvary as his blood would flow. The Bible said in Ephesians 1 and 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. His blood. The psalmist made a profound statement that I believe applies. He said, wash me and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be clean. Romans 5 and 8 tells us much more than being now justified, declared not guilty by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That's how much he loves you. He gave himself for you that he might redeem you. He purchased you. That's what the work of salvation is. And he purifies unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So on this Palm Sunday, I say this to you. If you don't know him or if you've been playing, if you've fallen from him, if you've been intoxicated by the false spirit of religion that is in this world, your eyes have been diverted from the cross, then I tell you today on this Palm Sunday that he's reaching for you. What must I do to be saved? Romans 10 and 9 said, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you would be saved. It's pretty simple, but yet profound. It's all about what you believe. Do you believe that God raised him from the dead, that Jesus rose from the dead? We're going to celebrate that next week. Do you believe it? If you believe it and you choose on, based on what you believe to confess Jesus Christ as the master controller of your life, you give him control. You let him come in and make it like you never sinned a day in your life. The Bible said that you would be saved. Numbered among the redeemed. And so, Father, right now I pray for those that are listening to me. Lord, I ask your Holy Spirit to touch where I cannot touch. I ask your Holy Spirit to draw and woo and bring men and women to you. God, let them understand today is the day of salvation. Lord, let there be a renewal. Lord, let there be a coming back. Let there be a cry of Hosanna unto the Lord. Lord, save today by your grace. Let decisions be made, I pray. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. And I want to say this to you. If you're listening to me right now and you want to be saved, if you will text that in the stream, I want to be saved. You'll be contacted privately and somebody will pray with you. Do something about it today because he loves you that much. This will be the greatest day of your life. Palm Sunday in the middle of a global pandemic, you'll look back on this day as the day that life came to you. Hallelujah. He loves you. He loves you that much. Let him do what he wants to do. God bless you. We love you. We thank God for you. We're looking forward to the day that we can all be back together and celebrate together. 
But until then, stay strong and continue to believe. We love you and we'll see you next time. God bless you.